Welcome to Church of the Rock from Winnipeg. Stay tuned to this week's thought-provoking message from Pastor Mark Hughes. Today I'm going to carry on in the series that began a few weeks ago titled Pursuing Your Potential. And we've been talking about how every one of you has this immense and great potential. Week one was the Peter Principle. And I mentioned to you, suggested perhaps, that most of us are living far below our potential. And like Peter, what happened with him is this anonymous fisherman from the Sea of Galilee encountered Jesus and everything changed. Week two, we talked about living beyond your limits. And I said, you know, our potential is really limitless because once you reach your limit in life, if you can push through that limit, and live beyond that limit, guess what? Your limit has to move. And so our potential is actually a moving target, and we can live into this moving target, and that's why it's a journey, not a destination. Well, today we're going to talk about living beyond your imagination. And you know what? I want to suggest to you that the imagination is one of the most powerful forces in the universe. All innovation, all invention, all creativity actually comes from the imagination. It comes from the minds of people that are determined not to live by the limits of what already exists, but to see that which does not exist and to pursue those things. And that's where our potential is. I want to show you a quote from Einstein. How many think he was a pretty smart dude? He was a smart dude, and this is what he said. Imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited to all we know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world and all there ever will be to know and understand. So knowledge lives in the now, the imagination lives into where we could go and what could be. And so there's an immense power in this. So I want to tell you a little story to illustrate the power of imagination, probably seriously one of my very favorite stories. And it's the story of James Nesmith. He was a pilot in the Vietnam War. His plane got shot down over Vietnam. He got captured by the Viet Cong. And he was held as a prisoner of war for seven years in a cell like this. It was a five foot by five foot cube made out of bamboo. It's the same thing that they would use as a tiger cage. He lived for seven years in that. I don't know if you could even see yourself living for seven years in this, but he did. Should have died, probably could have died, easily died. I mean, he suffered malnutrition and sickness and dysentery. And uh, that, if that wasn't bad enough, the whole physical aspect of living in a bamboo cage for seven years, he knew that he had to do something to maintain his sanity. One's mental health is at more risk than anything else. And so he knew he needed to do something, so this is what he decided to do. You ready for this? He decided to take up golf. Seriously take up golf. And you say, how did he golf? Well, in his mind, in his imagination. So this is what he did. Every single day, he would play golf. He would play 18 holes, sometimes 36. If he had time, he always had time. <laughs> and uh, he would actually play uh, courses that he knew. Now understand this, if you're gonna play golf in your mind, it's no good to just you know, hit a hole and run every, you know, or hole in one, every uh, you know, hole. Uh, then it's done in you know, 10 minutes and you're done. What he did was he lived every moment in real time. He imagined the wind on his face and the sun on his back. He imagined every blade of grass and the trees rustling. He imagined the weather, whether it was cold that day or hot, whether it was raining. He'd play in any kind of weather. And he would go out there and he'd imagine every tee shot and every step as he walked down the fairway. And you know, every shot's not a perfect shot. And if he went and sliced into the rough, he'd go into the rough. And if he was behind a tree, he would imagine chipping out onto the fairway from behind that tree. And he played golf like that for his entire seven years in his mind. So then when he finally was released and he came back to North America and actually had some serious physical recovery he had to go through, and once he recovered, there was one thing he wanted to do. And guess what it was? You got it. He wanted to go onto the golf course. And so he went out, he found his golf buddy, the two of them went out, first time out in eight years, and he shoots, are you ready for this? He shoots a 74. He'd never shot uh, under 90 his entire life before that, and all of a sudden he shoots 74. His friend couldn't believe it. He said, how is this possible that you come out and the first time out, you shoot a 74? He says, are you kidding? I haven't shot over 80 in almost three years. <laughs> and so I just want to you know, use that to illustrate the power of the imagination. Now, I need to give you a little caveat right here and right now 
because I think sometimes we misunderstand this, because we have the human potential movement. People like Tony Robbins and these motivational speakers, and what they have done is they have co-opted the principles of Scripture and the principles of God, and they've taken God out of the equation. And it's all about dynamic imaging and the positive power thinking and speaking the right words and all those things. But here's what I don't want you to miss. If you take God out of the equation, it is nothing more than New Age incantations. And the end of those things without God, I'm telling you, it's not a good ending. Because what it does is it leads us towards materialism, pettiness, and selfishness. It's, it's like the story of this couple. They're celebrating their 25th anniversary. Here they are both in their early 50s. And he knows his wife likes antiques, so he buys her this beautiful antique lamp. She rubs the lamp, and imagine a genie comes out. The genie pops out and says, happy anniversary. Because it's your anniversary, I'm going to grant you each one wish. So the wife, she didn't think about it long. She said, I know what I want. I want to live in a beautiful mansion with lots of money and cars and clothes and all of that so I can live comfortably for the rest of my life. And poof, there they were in the mansion. And the guy, uh, the genie turned to the guy and said, what would you like? He said, well, when I look at all this, there's only one thing I would really want more than all this. And that would be for my wife to be half my age. And poof, he was 102. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to show you just one little tiny verse here today. I'm going to show it to you the NIV because I like the way it says it. And this is the verse. Listen carefully. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. Did you catch that? It says he, the one who, who lives and rules and reigns in the heavens, he is able to do more in your life, immeasurably more than you can ask or even imagine. And it happens by his power, not by your human potential, but by the power that is working in you, the power of God. So here's what I want to do today. I want to give you three things related to your imagination to help you on this journey to fulfill or to pursue your potential. And here they are on the screen. They're number one. All creation begins in the imagination. Number two, imagination is an essential part of faith. And number three, your potential is only limited to your imagination. So I want you to think about this, is that all creation, all innovation, all invention actually comes from the imagination. It's first imagined. Everything's created twice. Once in the imagination and then in the reality. And I would argue that even for God, Everything was first created in his imagination. Now, we know this, that God created the world through his word, right? It's, it's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, and it says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, right? He said, Let there be light, and there was light. So his word created all these things, so we don't argue that. But the rest of the verse goes on and say that we would know that the things which are seen were made from that which was not visible. And see, the thing that is not visible is the imagination. And if you don't think God has an imagination, then think again. Because everything that exists came out of the imagination of God. It says that his ways are above our ways, and his thoughts, same word as imagination, his imagination is above our imagination. And everything you see, God first imagined it, and then he spoke his word, and it came into being. And what an imagination God has when you think about it, right? He imagined a universe that was 13.6 billion light years from one side to the other. There are 100 billion galaxies in the universe, and each galaxy, like this one, the pinwheel galaxy, each one of these galaxies has 100 billion stars. And then he took one of that 100 billion galaxies called the Milky Way, and he put a tiny little dot in it called planet Earth. And on that tiny little dot, he put 8.7 billion forms of life different species. Species we'll never know, never see many of them. Surely we will not be able to name them. He imagined these amazing creatures, birds that fly in the air that don't even have to come down. They can just soar in the air. So beautiful, so extraordinary, they don't even look real. He's got fish that live under the water, in the sea, 
that are so spectacular, you wonder, how did he even think of all these different species? He's got one fish that lives on the very bottom of the ocean that looks prehistoric, that will never see the light and will never see a human being because it's too deep. All it can do is send a probe down with a camera. And there was these creatures that God's created at the bottom of the sea that no man will ever see. And then, of course, just to mess with your head, he created the duck-billed platypus. <laughs> and I mean, think about this creature. It has the bill of, of a duck and the, and the you know, feet of a duck, the body of an otter. It doesn't live on the land. It lives in the water. It cannot fly. It's a mammal, and it lays eggs. Why would God do that? Because God is God, and he can do whatever he wants. And if he wants to break his own rules, he just goes ahead and breaks them. And he just imagined this creature for your pleasure. And then, of course, after he'd done all these things, he made mankind. And the human genome that we have finally cracked, we have now discovered that the DNA has three billion base pairs. And every cell in your body has this immense construction. And what God does is he alters that construction ever so slightly so that no two human beings look or are exactly the same. Billions and billions of people entirely different from one another just by a little tweak of the DNA. Except for, a, of course, a twin, right? An identical twin? Why? Because God can break it if he wants. They're his rules. So this is what God has done. He has done these immense things in the universe and created all of these wonderful things just so that we would know. So let's talk about this because we are created in the image of God, right? He created man. In the image of God, he created a male and female. And so if we were created in the image of God, then that means our creativity. We have this creativity. We have this imagination similar to God. Not quite, but similar to God. And so we can imagine so much in this world because God has given this imagination. But I want you to think about this because I think something has happened. I think we have lost something of our imagination. You know, there was a CEO of Hallmark Cards, and his name was Gordon McKenzie. And uh, they're the, you know Hallmark cards. They're the ones that, that you buy those beautiful cards and they have these beautiful sentimental things that you give to people you love to say to them because you can't think of anything to say to them. <laughs> and so somebody being paid $12 an hour thinks of something for you to say to them. That's Gordon McKenzie. And he used to travel to schools and go around to these you know, little kids and give these speeches and career day and the like. And he observed something that, that children in grade one, he'd say, how many of you are artists? And 100% would put up their hands, because kids are very imaginative, all of them. And they're 100% are artists, but by grade two, only 50% would put up their hand. And by grade three, only 30% would put up their hand. And by grade six, he said that only two or three percent of the kids would say that they were artists. And you know what that tells me? That tells me that we live in a culture that tries to conform us. That tells me that we live in a culture that tries to squelch, to snuff out our creativity and our imagination. And you know, when I heard, read the story about Gordon McKenzie and these kids, it, it reminded me of my own childhood. Because when I was in primary school, up until grade three, I couldn't read. Could not read. Now I had some, some you know, I had some sort of neurological reasons why. I was, I was sort of semi-dyslexic. Uh, I could not seem to get the, this, I, could, I didn't read back to front, but I got the syllables mixed up. And see, like the word outlook, even to this day, always looks like look out to me. So when you look at the weather, it's outlook for tomorrow. When I look at the weather, it's look out for tomorrow. <laughs> it's frightening, the weather. <laughs> and it, it catches me every, every time I look at it. And I mean, and Christmas was terrifying for me because I got a lot of gifts from Satan. <laughs> so here I was, here I was, honest to goodness, I'm in grade three, I still can't read why they were passing me just to get rid of me. But here's what was going on in my life. I was seriously as dumb as a post, but I had a great imagination. And I spent my day looking out the window and imagining things. And then art class would come. Remember, he had art class in the, always in the afternoon. And art class would come, and I, could, I was the best artist in the class. I couldn't read, but I could create. And I could draw any cartoon character. I could walk, draw Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck or Goofy. I could do them all by memory. And then they would ask us to do something more complicated, and I'd do ink sketches, and I'd do pencil sketches. My teacher would look at him and say, he's the dumbest kid in the class, and he can create this. And so she would go submit them into art contests, and I would always win. All the way through junior school, like primary school, I was winning all these art contests and bringing home these ribbons and stuff and hanging them up. I didn't even know what I was doing. 
But when they did, what they did was they taught me how to read. And they wanted me to be normal. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> and by grade six, I was normal. Well, relatively, <laughs> compared to what I was before. So by grade six, I'm sort of a normal person. I could learn how to, I learned how to read by then. But here was the problem. I stopped creating. I stopped drawing. I stopped painting. I stopped all those things. And for 30 years, I never did it. And when I was 40 years old, I had an accident. I crashed while I was snowboarding. And I, and I hit my head, and I got post-concussive syndrome. I had a concussion. I had post-concussive syndrome for a whole year. And I was dizzy, and I was headachy, and I got kind of despondent, and I had to push through life, and push to come to church and preach. And life was hard for that entire year. But I guess when I bumped my head, what happened was I somehow dislodged some of the creativity. And what I would do is I couldn't wait to be done work at the end of the day, and I'd rush home, and I started painting. I was 40, and I had a concussion, and I was painting. And I would pull out the watercolors, and I would start painting, and I'd start drawing these. I took all the kids' pictures off the fridge, and I put my own pictures on. <laughs> they said, Pop, why did you take down our pictures? I said, because mine are better. <laughs> these are amazing. So this went on for about six months until my, my post-concussive syndrome left. And guess what left with it? My creativity, it went, and I stopped painting. Now, whenever I do something even remotely creative, my kids say, did you bump your head again? <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the first thing, that all creativity comes from the imagination. The second thing, and this is where I'm going with this, the second thing is that imagination is a key component in faith. And this is what Hebrews 1, it defines faith. It says, now faith is the substance of things, what? Hope. Hoped for. The evidence of things, what? unseen. Faith is things hoped for and unseen. You know what things are hoped for and unseen? Things in your imagination. See, if there's something that you do not have, it does not exist in your life, but you hope for it, it only exists one place. Where? In your imagination. It's the only place that, it, that exists. And so your imagination is so key. If you can't imagine something, I guarantee you, you will never have it. If you can't imagine God doing something in your life, I guarantee you, you will never receive it. Here's, here's an example from Scripture. It's from the book of Genesis. We have a guy named Abraham, Abram at the beginning. And God comes to him at 75 years old. And he says, Abram, you will be a father of many nations. Well, one tiny little problem. Tiny little problem was that he was old, his wife was old, she was beyond childbearing years. They had no children and it didn't look very promising. Nine years after that promise, nine years go by, he's 84 years old, and there's still no kids. Now, here's what I don't know. I don't know if he was doing his part. I don't, I don't know if he was, like, chasing Sarah around the bed or not. I have no, I have, you know, I have no way of reading between the lines. I'm like, come on, Abraham, get with it. You've got to do your part. Chase her. Chase her. I know she's a bit saggy. She's still good for it. You know, and, and, and you know, I don't know if he was doing that or not. So, I mean, after nine years, God shows up again and says, this, this ain't working. He says, I got an idea. Abraham, come on outside with me. And he takes him outside and he says, look at the heavens. And he says, look at the stars of the heavens and count them if you can. And then he said this, and so shall your descendants be. And then this is what the, the scripture says. And it says, and Abraham believed the Lord. See, for nine years, he didn't believe him. For nine years, you know, he was told that he was going to be the father of many nations, but it wasn't until God showed him the picture. And he took that visual and he imprinted it on his imagination. He says, see those stars? And if you can see these stars, and if you can number these stars, so shall your descendants be. And once he got the picture, once he could see it, it said he believed the Lord. And we, of course, know the rest of the story, that he had children, and his children had children, and his children's children had children. And today there is a race of Jewish people in every country of the world today that all came from the loins of Abraham. Probably somewhere in the number or beyond, probably beyond the stars that he was able to catch that day. See, that's the power of the imagination with faith. I want to tell you a story today. Those of you who have been around long enough will remember this. For some number of years ago, my older brother had a tragic accident. It was a freak accident on the ski slope. He was actually on the bunny slope with his six-year-old daughter, and he went off the slope, wasn't watching what he was doing, and hit a tree. He broke his neck, and my brother ended up in the hospital as a quadriplegic. And he was paralyzed from the, from the neck down, probably 95% paralyzed. 
And when he lay there, he could only move his right arm just up and down like this at the elbow. He couldn't move his fingers, couldn't lift his arm up, couldn't move anything else, had no feeling in the rest of his body. And he laid there. And he got some feeling back and some things started to happen in his body, but he was really badly damaged. And the doctors, they told him this, they said, you'll be in the hospital for a year and you will never walk again. My poor, poor brother had to lie in that hospital bed and you can do nothing. When you're a quadriplegic, you can't do much for yourself. And he just had to lie there and he couldn't move his body and he couldn't feed himself and he couldn't go to the bathroom and he couldn't do any of this stuff. And all he could do was stare at the ceiling. And so what he decided to do, and this was a bit of his nature anyway, he decided that he was going to continue to live his life in his imagination. And when I would go see him, and I went to see him every day during this time, and when I'd go see him every day, he was doing a different activity. He was playing tennis, or he was kayaking, and he would do those things in his mind, in his imagination. And I'll tell you one thing he did every single day was he walked, and he imagined himself walking. Two months went by, he was getting some better, and there was strength coming back in some parts of his body, and feeling coming back in some parts of his body. And, they, and then, he, then after about two months, he told the nurses and doctors that he was leaving. And uh, they're going, you're not going anywhere. He said, no, I'm leaving. And they said, you haven't even been fitted for a wheelchair. And he says, I'm not getting a wheelchair. I'm not getting fitted for a wheelchair because I don't need a wheelchair because I'm walking out of here. He was the worst patient. And he wouldn't do what they say. And he just imagined himself walking out. And uh, he went to rehab every day. And then what happened was he would get these muscle spasms where his whole core would stiffen up like this. And he found he, when it stiffened up like this, he could stand up. And then he thought, if I can just get one foot in front of the other, when my core is stiffened up by this muscle spasm, I'll be able to walk. Two and a half months into that time in the hospital, months and months before he was supposed to be released, he got out of that bed with the help of his wife, and he walked, he looked like Frankenstein, <laughs> but he walked to the elevator door. And he walked to that elevator door like this, all stiff and all awkward, and he turned around in the elevator, the nurses and the doctors showed up. He said, so long, suckers. <laughs> <laughs> and he walked out of that place. And I'll tell you, I, I, it was a combination of stubborn determination for sure and faith. But don't miss this. He could see himself walking, and only he who can see the invisible can do the impossible. That was Frank Gaines that said that. But I don't want you to miss this fact that, that imagination is linked to our faith. And without faith you, and imagination, you're not going to achieve what you want in life and your potential. So I want to give you the other side of this equation. Because obviously I'm talking about imagining positive things and I'm imagining God's plan for your life. But do you know there's a lot of people with a negative imagination? And there are people who go life through life, what? Imagining the worst. And there's nothing worse than imagining the worst. And people who go through life thinking it's not going to succeed, it's going to fail, I'm going to get sick, I'm going to die, uh, you know, there's going to be an accident. And you all know people like that. I know you do. And you, have, you know people that they have a hard time not looking at life negatively. And the scripture says this, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so what you think about, what, you're, what you imagine, see, here's what imagination is. It's a look into the future. That's what you do when you imagine something. You're looking at where you're going to go. You're looking at your potential. And if that's negative thoughts, if you, if you think it's not going to work out, if you think you're going to get sick, if you think you're going to be in an accident, if you think you're going to get, die, guess what? You just might. There's this immense story. Happened in the 1950s. True story. It's about a Portuguese sailor. He was on a Portuguese ship that delivered wine. And it had gone to a port in Scotland. And they, had, uh, they were in the port there, and they were unloading their wine. And this sailor went into the refrigerated cooler to check and see if they had got all the stock off for that particular port. While he was in there, one of the other sailors, not knowing he was in there, shut the door behind him. There was no exit from that, no door, no door handle on the inside. So he was trapped in there for four days until the ship went back to Lisbon, Portugal. And when they got into port in Lisbon, they opened the door to that refrigerated container, and there he was slumped dead on the floor. But what was sort of interesting about this was he had chronicled the last four days. And he had taken a pen, and he started just writing right on the wall what was happening. And he talked about day one, and day one, he, the cold began to overtake him, and he began to shiver. And then he talked about day two, and on day two, he was beginning to get numbness in his fingers and his extremities, and on his lips, and his skin was turning blue. 
And then on day three, he talked about how he had beginning to experience paralysis. And paralysis is on one hand an extreme pain, on the other. And on day four, there was no entry because he was dead. But here's the kicker of this entire story. When they opened it and found him slumped dead in the corner, they realized this whole time that the refrigeration unit had not been turned on and the temperature in the unit was 19 degrees Celsius. It was room temperature, but he didn't know that because he was imagining he was freezing to death and he froze to death because that's what he imagined. I know that's a bizarre story. You think, how could this possibly be? But you see, as a man thinks in his heart, this is well documented in the psychological journals, that you can really end up living into whatever you imagine. That's why, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's why we have to be so careful with what we do and what we imagine and what we believe is going to happen and, and, and the words that we say. So the first thing is this, that all creativity comes from the imagination. The second thing is this, that creati or imagination is an essential part of your faith. And the last and final thing is this, is that your potential is only limited to your imagination. See, if we can think it, we can have it. But I, I want to give you a little, another little caveat on this. We have to be really careful about what we pursue in life. And a lot of times what we do is we, we, we hear these, you know, motivational speakers and we start pursuing things that really aren't helpful for us. And we're not really pursuing our God-given goal in life. And see, when it says he is able to do immeasurably more than you can think or ask according to the power that works within you, he's talking about you pursuing your potential and your destiny in him. And he wants to perform in him the dream that he has put in your heart. And there are things in this world, and you know, you might succeed in attaining them. And they might be the things of this world, the materialistic things, and houses, and cars, and all kinds of things. But you know what the scripture says? They're nothing more than wood, hay, and stubble. And in eternity, they will be burned up by fire. And the only thing that will be left will be the gold, and the silver, and the precious stones. Those things that really make a difference in the people around you and the world in which you live. Let me close with one final story here. And it's the story of Billy Graham. Now, almost everybody in this room would know who Billy Graham is, one of the most successful preachers of all time. And in 1937, he was in the Florida Bible School, and he had never preached to a single soul, not once. And the Bible School was on the Hillsborough River, and every Saturday morning when classes weren't on, he would get in a rowboat, and he would go across the river to an island. And this island had been logged, and it had cypress trees, and all the trees were cut down, and there were nothing but tree stumps. And he would row out to that, and he would carry his Bible. He would find a tree stump and he'd set his Bible on that tree stump and he would begin to preach to those tree stumps. I've never preached to tree stumps. I've preached to some pretty quiet crowds, but never tree stumps. <laughs> and he would preach to these tree stumps and if an alligator or a bird or a squirrel showed up, they'd get preached to too. And he would preach to these tree stumps the whole time, imagining them that they were crowds of people gathering and hanging on every word. And he did that Saturday after Saturday after a Saturday. And he imagined that one day he would preach to the multitudes. Well, you know the end of the story. Nobody in human history has preached it live to as many people as Billy Graham. 215 million people have come out to hear Billy Graham preach. And it all began preaching to tree stumps. See, if you can imagine it, that's what your potential can go. And it needs to be rooted in God. And I want to come right back to that because it's him that is able to do more than you can ask or that you can think. Your potential in him is really unlimited. And we need to embrace the dream that God has for us. He has far more than you know right now that he wants to place in your heart a dream and a vision. He wants you to imagine what you could be in him to change your world and to make it a better place. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, and we can live beyond our imagination. Let's stand together, shall we? The one question a person should ask is, what on earth am I doing here? In Pastor Mark's new book, A Greater Purpose, you will fully realize that we are all here for a divine purpose. This book will help you discover your own personal destiny. You can order a copy by visiting our website at churchoftherock.ca. Order a copy today and begin your journey to finding your place in God's great big space.